So let's just start off by saying um, welcome to all of you and Domain of the Bee is a very small domain that Amanda and I have uh, started and tiny bit of background on me, I, I, I spent 15 years working for UK supermarkets. Um, first of all Safeway, then Sainsbury's, then Waitrose. I actually headed up the Waitrose wine team for about five years. Um, but before that, three years before that, I'd actually been making wine. Um, now, I didn't get qualified. I travelled around the world. I, I went to various different places, South Africa, um, France, Hungary, Romania, and made wine in lots of places. And I always had this idea in the back of my mind, I wanted to make my own wine somewhere. And so all the time I was being a buyer, I was looking around for exciting places. Um, really decided that France was probably the place it was going to be because my French language is reasonably good and it's close to England, easy to get to. And there's a profusion of amazing wine regions. And it was on a trip, uh, I think 2002, I was there as a Sainsbury's buyer and I went to a village in the Corbière called Coucignon, which is absolutely stunningly beautiful. It's in the Cathar country. I'd like to know at this stage, with a show of hands, if I may, who has been to the south of France, first of all? I can see maybe half, maybe slightly more than half of you. That's great. Who's actually been specifically to the Roussillon region or the Cathar Castles region? Only a couple, only a few. So I think that's Robin and Alexis waving at me there. Um, I've probably missed, I can't actually see everyone on the screen at the same time because we've got, oh gosh, two screens full. So yeah, we've now got 30 people joining in, so that's great. So it is a stunningly beautiful part of France. And if you get the chance to go there, uh, which I hope you will, and you're extremely welcome to come and visit us when you do. Um, and I hope to show you some from some of the photographs. It is absolutely stunning. And that is part of the attraction of the region to me. Not only is the quality of the wine potentially extremely good, uh, the land prices are cheap, which is a, a major draw to a penniless uh, aspirational winemaker. Um, and you can get started there really without a lot of money. Um, but it's also you know, stunningly beautiful. So every time I walk out uh, in one of the vineyards and look up at the mountains, I get a little shiver of excitement that we are one of the most beautiful parts of France. So what I might do now is I'm gonna share my screen and show you where in France we actually are. Um, I should have here um, a Google Earth um, map. So I'm gonna zoom right out. What you're looking at there is actually the winery. Um, we're zooming right out, this is the Roussillon region, we're zooming further out to the bottom right hand corner of France. You might start to recognise it in a minute. Uh, you can see the Pyrenees there along the bottom and I hope all of you now recognise that uh, we're in southern France um, and I'm going to zoom back in. So if, you know, we're really quite far south, we're as far south as you can get in France. It's the hottest and driest part of France, it's really near the Spanish border and we're quite influenced by, uh, by Spain. In fact, where we are is actually what's known as French Catalonia. Um, Spanish Catalonia is just across the border. So all this area here is Spanish Catalonia. Barcelona is down here. In fact, Catalonia goes all the way down to here, I think. Um, and we're in the bit that was French. That actually was Spanish for about three, 400 years. So the Roussillon region, uh, and now you're probably familiar with the Languedoc Roussillon, and I hope you can all see at this point uh, well enough with enough detail to make out uh, some of the features, it can be a bit grainy at times. But the, the, the Rhone River comes down here through Avignon and out in this delta here in the Camargue. Um, and it, really everything to the left of the Rhone is the Languedoc. So uh, Nîmes onwards really, Montpellier, Béziers, Narbonne, onto Carcassonne, that is the Languedoc region. And when you hear about the Languedoc Roussillon, it's the amalgamation of this Languedoc region and the Roussillon, which is this bit down here. And there is a bit of a gap, you can see there's quite a lot of green in between, and that's the Corbière, which is really mountains and hills with a few vineyards. That's still in the Languedoc, um, and we are just to the south of the Corbière. So zoom in on the Roussillon. Right, now, a few of you might have possibly ever been down to Collier and Banyuls, two beautiful little fishing ports. And this is where the Pyrenees come down to the sea. You can see the Spanish border here, um, and this is about an hour from where we are. Um, it's a lovely coast and this is a, a big flat bay. This whole area here is a plain and then there are three rivers that come out of the mountains. One that runs through here, the Agli Valley, and there's the Tet and the Tech. Um, and those three rivers all drain down from the Pyrenees. The highest mountain in the Pyrenees uh, at this end is called the Peak de Canigou and it's a very very visible sort of pointy mountain at the bottom of the, um, uh, bottom of the Pyrenees. Um, and so where the crosses are are where the vineyards we bought are and this is the most I think the most high quality region. So Collier and Banyuls is an amazing region and really beautiful, but great for tourists, has really lovely wine um, and sells the wine at a high price because there are lots of tourists who visit there. Um, 
but really hard farming and really hard to work. Uh, but some of the best wine in the region. And the next best region, or probably equal best, is this area around here, the northern um, uh, Roussillon. Um, I'm just going to show you the, the boundary between the Roussillon and, uh, and the Corbière. So can you see this line of hills here? That is a really quite steep limestone escarpment. Cucunion, the little village on the, on the other side here. And then we are the other side, this valley here, Mori, has got a limestone escarpment on that side and a limestone escarpment on this side. It's almost like a gun barrel pointing down towards the sea. And those, these are quite high hills. And we'll do a little flyover in a, in a while just to kind of show you in a bit more detail what that looks like. Um, so we ended up going on this, uh, to this region for our holidays uh, in 2003. And we totally loved it. And um, my son was about five at the time. Um, we just thought the region was absolutely stunning. Uh, and we tasted some wine there that, that was amazing. We met these two English guys um, who were working in the village of Mori. And so we decided that, um, you know, we, we put the word out that we'd be interested if a vineyard came up for sale to buy one. And in February, later that year, the early 2004, they gave me a call and said, we found a vineyard. Did I want to buy it? So I had no real idea. And, and I hadn't uh, had a bit of winemaking experience. I hadn't a lot of vineyard experience. So I jumped on a plane and flew out there and stood in the middle of this vineyard. And um, I went, I don't know, is it a good vineyard or not? How many of you, if you walked into a vineyard, would sort of instinctively feel that it was a good one or, or not? We had some good knowledge that it was in a, in a great little side valley. And actually, it's this vineyard here, this X here. So when I zoom in, what you'll see is these fields are essentially, in this area, pretty much all vines. You can see this big area, this swathe of vineyards around here, around Massamiel, the most famous winery in the region. Pretty much every block there is a block of vines, or it was a block of vines that's been taken out and had something else planted in it. So it's really a monoculture of vines here. And um, what you can also see here is uh, these little vineyard blocks. And there's the side valley here, the, the, and this is where we bought our first vineyard. And I'm just going to zoom in and show you in a bit more detail. Um, I hope you're enjoying this chance to sort of see the detail of the region. But the, one of the amazing things about um, Google is Google Earth is quite how much detail you can get. So if I zoom right in, you can pretty much see every individual vine in that vineyard. And you can see that there's quite a lot of gaps, quite a lot of vines that, uh, this is a very old vineyard, it's around 100 years old. Um, and the, you know, the, some of the vines are just, uh, have just died in that time. They're, they're uh, you know, it's, it's, vines do eventually age and die. And you can start to replace them, but then you've got young vines and old vines mixed. So we've never replaced any vines here. These are all the original vines. Um, and it's the only area that actually we ripped out is this area up here, which one vintage I picked the grapes. So we, we counted the baskets from that. 30 rows of vines, maybe there were 20 rows of vines. We had uh, seven baskets of grapes in its entirety from 300 vines. And we thought at that point, there's just simply no point in us uh, continuing farming that block. So we actually pulled the vines out um, and did the same down here in this block here um, because that's very steep downhill and it's really hard to get the tractor down there and therefore the vines get neglected a bit because they don't get um, the treatments that they need. Um, but these are wonderful old bush vines and I'll show you some photographs in a little while. Um, let me actually click on, there may even be some photographs that appear here. So I hope on the screen on the top right, you can see a couple of pictures that are attached to this Coombe de Bois vineyard. This is a vine that grows on the edge of the road. So it's actually uh, pretty much here. Um, he's called Hector. Um, and I take a photograph of him every time I drive past because it's nice to see how he changes through the seasons. And we've got lots of lovely photographs of him just putting out some fresh uh, buds and then growing into little shoot, shoots and then growing into enormous bush of, of green. And then you know, being the leaves falling off in the autumn and then being pruned back again in the winter. And we've got lots of cycles of, of, of Hector. He's right on the edge there, and it's been raining so much recently that it's eroding here. And it won't be very long before Hector finally falls onto the road because um, the, uh, the land on which he's standing is gradually eroding. Um, so I think it's probably time to show you a few photographs. I'm not gonna to go too much. What we'll do very quickly is I might just do a, um, a 3D view. So we're gonna go into the, the 3D view. So you can see where this is a little side valley um, and there's quite steep hills on either side. And the high point, the reason we call it Domain of the Bee, Domain of the Bee, is just right ahead of you, right at the top of the screen about now, above the vineyard, is a little patch of uh, a high point, which is called the Rock de la Bay. Um, and that means the Rock of the Bee, and it's the highest point um, 
hang on a moment, I've got my phone ringing. I'm going to just put them aside. Hang on, Jeff, so sorry. There's one further person needing to be let into the Zoom call. So give me a moment while I, I have to do this. There we go. Jeff, really sorry. Hang on. Jeff, I hope we've let you in now. Sorry to leave you out for so long. Um, I'm in the middle of just showing everybody our vineyard, so forgive me while I go back to the screen share. Are you all, are you all uh, awake? Because when it goes on the screen share, I can't see you anymore. Good, good. Okay, good to know. Um, quickly back onto the screen share. Um, and let's scroll around the vineyard again. So what I wanted to also show you was some of the, um, the mountains. So we're going to very quickly go back to 2D. I'll zoom a bit out again. Uh, this is the little town of Mori, and then on this side you've got this incredible um, ridge of hills with uh, the castle of um, Caribus on the escarpment. And if what I just go in and zoom around here, you can see this notch in the hills where Cucunyo is, and these lovely steep-sided, um, 600 metre high limestone escarpments. Um, and that's what makes the scenery so dramatic. And when you drive up this road, the Col de Lausine, up to the, uh, the side there, you can basically see the whole of the Pyrenees stretching ahead of you. And there's absolutely stunning view across the Roussillon, looking up to your right. Um, and it's really very inspiring. And, and anyone who comes gets forced by me to come and uh, go up to the castle, which is actually up here. For some reason, buildings don't uh, render very well on Google Earth, but it's this rather amazing castle perched on this rock. So when you come and visit, you'll definitely get made to come and see the castle. And uh, there's another very fine castle nearby. So I hope you get, that gives you an idea of the, the scenery. You probably had a look at the website. There's a few photographs that will show you quite how stunning it is. Um, so let us go back now to stopping the screen share. And I might actually now just show you a few photographs. Uh, and it's getting towards quarter past. So it's probably nearly time for a drink. Um, uh, da, 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 how do I move the slides forward? There we go. So we've established where we are down there. Um, done all this really. This is a soil map. Now, no, forgive very I mean, 30 seconds on soil. I don't want to, soil is very boring for most people, but it's very exciting for winemakers. Um, there is some amazing, around this valley here, this grey area is this black schist, which is very, very distinctive and specific to this region. And this bit here, this bit here, and this bit here down to the right are a kind of um, also similar schist. And so this soil type is very specific to this uh, Banyuls uh, Collier area and the Mori area, and uh, it gives you a very distinctive wine style. And then the three rivers, the Agli, the Tet, and the Tech, the Tech along here, um, bring a lot of gravel and things down from the mountains. So a lot of these green bits are river pebbles and uh, uh, silted clay. Uh, and I think I've said enough about uh, uh, vineyards, except to say that there is a limestone ridge here and here, which I'll show you in a bit more detail. Um, those are the mountains that I showed you. Um, have a look at this. When the Pyrenees formed, the Iberian Peninsula was separate from France and it kind of crashed into the bottom of France and it started pushing the land together and it's concertinaed the sedimentary land that was there before. So you can see in the white here, this is a layer of limestone which has been folded and on top of it is a layer of black schist. And this really nicely describes the area around Mori, the village that we went over earlier on. That's the Chateau de Caribus, that's Cucunion. And you've got this ridge of steep limestone on both sides and this uh, black schist in the basin. And all of our vineyards are on this black schist of Mori. Um, and it's really quite an important part of the way the wines taste. So we've got three blocks. Uh, that one there, the first one we bought, and then another block here and another block over here. And uh, we're gonna actually, I think at this point, skip to taste some wines. I think the time has come. Um, let us just go to Field of the Bee. Um, so I hope, or I'm actually going to go off the screen share now because I want to see you all and I can't when I'm sharing the screen, so just forgive me a moment. Um, I hope you all have received your wines. Um, if anyone wants to tell me on the chat, uh, I know a couple of bottles uh, arrived with broken lids. We got one set of sample, uh, set of the, uh, the, lid, the, the bottles that we ordered about 10 of the lids were actually broken and we tried to select through and find all the broken ones. I think we didn't find all of them because a couple of people ended up with empty bottles. I think I managed to solve one of those by, by sending one in time but another person has sadly not got an empty bottle but, uh, uh, but did actually had a full bottle of the B-Pink anyway so um, luckily able to taste that. Um, 
anyone else have any trouble with their, their samples? Good to know, everyone has got them in front of you. So you should have four bottles. We're gonna start with the field of the bee, which is our white. Um, I think my, now might be a good time. If you want to ask a question, um, why do you unmute yourselves and, and chip in? And we can have a bit of a chat. Um, I'm never very good at monologuing. I, I do like to have a bit of a conversation as we're going along. Um, so uh, has, has, if everyone wants to have a, have a smell, what we've got here is a, um, a Grenache white. So we all hope, um, if you are regular fans of Domain of the Bee, you may well know that the, the main grape we have is called Grenache. Um, and that is essentially a red grape. It's famous around the world as a red grape. But there are white variants and slightly pink tinged variants of Grenache. And our white wine is made from both Grenache Gris, which is coloured pink, and Grenache Blanc. Um, and it's a grape you don't see very often. But uh, we're trying to make a style of wine that's really, really easy to drink. Uh, has got some of the zip and freshness of a Sauvignon, a little bit more of a rich, soft peachiness of a, of a Chardonnay, but without that sort of heavy oak flavour. So we're not going for an oaky style. We do have a little bit of oak in this wine. Um, I think it's about 20% typically. Um, and these grapes, the, the white and the pink, the grapes actually come from my friend Jean-Marc. Um, and he has uh, his own... Sorry, have I got a question there? I was hearing a bit of noise on the microphone. I wasn't sure if someone was asking a question or just chatting. Um, so my, so the, the, to explain, when we first bought these three little vineyard blocks, Amanda and I, um, we have about four hectares in total. We were able to do so because we linked up with a friend of ours who's got a little bit more money than we have, who, who realised, we realised that to buy the vineyards and then start producing wine, we needed about three years of funding before we got any income. So you have to start farming in January. You pick some grapes in October. You have to finance the, the winemaking of those grapes, but then they go into barrel for a year and a half. And then the following spring, the, the spring after the spring after, you can start to bottle them and then you start selling them. So you start selling them about two and a half years after you first started farming. And all that time you've had costs and then you've got costs for shipping and storing and labeling and everything else. Um, so realistically, your first income doesn't start to come until three or four years after you start uh, investing. Um, and we're not talking about an enormous amount of money here, but it's 30 to 40,000 euros worth of cost every year to farm and, um, and produce those, those wines. And that's not including the labels and the capsules and things. And that's not nothing if you've got a bank account with you know, a few thousand pounds in it. That's all we had at the time. So having bought the first vineyard block ourselves, um, our friend Philippe joined in and has had a lovely time for the last few years, uh, enjoying visiting, enjoying being a partner in a wine business. Um, and uh, I, I believe he's, he's, he's drunk his... His profit. The profit, there's no, been no profit so far, but he's, he's gradually being returned his initial capital and he's had a lot of nice wines to drink and a, a lot, quite a few good holidays. Um, so that's how we kind of set ourselves up. But the one thing it didn't allow us to do is to buy a winery and it still hasn't. So we don't own uh, a physical premises for making wine. And we started working with our English friends, Richard and Mark, who were um, two of them together were trying to create a little domain themselves and they were renting buildings but they made our wine in their, in their rented buildings. Um, then uh, we moved on to the cellar that uh, an American guy came and built an absolutely beautiful cellar in the valley. Uh, 2009, 2010, 2011 of our wines were made in that cellar. But from then he then said he wanted to use all the space for himself, so we had to find somewhere else. So my friend Jean-Marc Lafarge, who's probably one of the best winemakers in the whole region, um, had taken on his family domain and was starting to grow it. So we were able to work in John Mark's cellar, and that's where we work now. Um, and these grapes for the white wine and the rosé wine actually belong to John Mark. So we're not using our own grapes for these wines. Um, we're using his. And um, you know, he's got all the gear you need to make really excellent white wine. We collaborate with him on, on um, the making and blending of this. Um, and I hope you like it. I'd love to hear what anyone happens to think about this wine. Um, who's already a fan? I know a few of you quite like Field of the Bee already. Um, Raise your hands if you, I can see someone, uh, Mary and Josh finishing their glasses there. Good to know, with a thumbs up. Um, so we, we, we originally set off to, to make a red wine. That was the plan. Um, and it's always been the core of what we, we do. And we always you know, want to make that the, the center of our, of our project. But we did realize fairly early on that a lot of people who were buying our red wine from us really liked also to be able to buy some white and some rosé. Um, and so we thought to ourselves, well, it would be quite a good idea for us to be able to try and make and sell a white and a rosé. So we're able to do that by working with Jean-Marc's grapes. Um, 
the law in France says if you call a wine domain, that you have to own all the land that goes into that wine. So our wine's called Domain of the Bee. Um, so when we decided to name our white and our pink, we decided we couldn't use the word Domain of the Bee. So the white is actually named after a, a Google Translate uh, slight mistranslation. But the word domain in France uh, means a land holding. And one time I just put Domain of the Bee into France in a, in a longer sentence that included lots of, other, lots of other things into Google Translate and translated it into English. And it came out as Field of the Bee. It took the word domain and turned it into field. And I thought, that's a lovely name, Field of the Bee, because these really, these little vineyards that I showed you on the map, they are just fields. And um, there are bees buzzing around all over, particularly the vineyards near the edge, which are up in, uh, the, the natural landscape around them is just garrigue, is what we call garrigue, which is kind of wild bush. But we have a lot of uh, rosemary, we have a lot of uh, a fennel, a lot of thyme, lots of cistus, lots of uh, holm oak. Um, and there's loads of bees buzzing around everywhere. So the combination of uh, the bees being present in the vineyard and the Rock de la Bay, which is the Rock of the Bee, was the origin of the name. And Field of the Bee seemed like a lovely name for the white. So um, I hope you've all had a chance to taste the Field of the Bee and, and um, I hope you like it. Um, I, I'm never a great one for kind of spinning too many tasting notes at you because you know, everyone tastes their own thing. And I think sometimes if I, if I quote a load of fruits at you, you might find uh, that you, you know, either taste the same thing or you don't. But I do find sometimes it, that it's got a, sort of a pineapple hint to it uh, in some years and definitely occasionally a white peach hint. So I don't know how many of you, I have this very strongly in my mind that my neighbours in Yorkshire when I was brought up, they had a greenhouse and they had uh, a white peach tree in the greenhouse. And I, I so remember aged about 10 being given a, a fresh white peach plucked off the Yorkshire greenhouse and smelling it. And I definitely get some of that note on, on, uh, on, on the white. Um, so I think probably time to move on to the pink wine. Um, I'm, I'm happy to solicit any questions at any point. So if you've got a question, either unmute yourself and ask it or just type it into the chat and be very happy to, um, to feel that. Um, and let's move on to the pink. So I've got a glass of that in front of me here. Um, it might just be worth pointing out or sharing with you the, um, the weekend that we had last weekend, which was, we'd done this before on a smaller scale, but we had really quite a lot of bottles to open, very, very carefully decant into the mini bottles, carefully screw the lids on. And then the packaging, the slightly uh, eccentric um, uh, sort of fabric packaging is actually, we have a kit box that we receive uh, once, a, once a week, which has got kit meals in it. And they always deliver... Um, the dairy and any uh, any uh, any meat or anything these are refrigerating inside this insulated block with a couple of ice blocks inside, um, and they're very good about uh, um, having packaging as recy much re recyclable as possible. So we thought it, it, we had loads of these stacked up because um, we've been receiving these boxes for some time and they haven't been taking back the recycling for the last four weeks, uh, four months. Um, so we thought we'd try and use it to to uh, send the bottles out. Um, and uh, so yeah a lot of drilling little holes in that popping the bottles in stapling the edges wrapping them up so that they didn't break and I hope they did all arrive um, safely so we were busy doing that over the weekend with this and um, you now got a little taste of bee pink um, it's really odd because you're all quiet now so I'm, I'm really keen why don't you all unmute or some thumbs I need I need some chat to find out that you're all enjoying yourself still, yourself still. smiles and thumbs smiles up and thumbs. we're just gonna say yum yum Great. Yum yum sounds good. Um, that works. How do you make rosé wine? How? Great yeah. question. So, very simply, white wine can be made from white grapes or black grapes because the juice of all grapes when you squash them is pretty colourless. So if you squash them and immediately take the juice, you can make white wine from it. Red wine can only be made from black grapes which have got pigments in the skin and you have to macerate the grapes in the juice for a while to get the colour to come out. So rosé wine logically can only be made from grapes with a, with a tint in them, if it's mm -hmm. red black grapes. Um, but you don't want too much colour to come out if you, if you don't want a very dark rosé. So yeah, actually, if you take a lot of grape varieties and crush them, um, if they're very ripe and dark coloured, the juice will be slightly pink tinged already. Um, so I said you can make white wine from black grapes, but you have to pick them young, pick them early, squash them quickly very, and very cleanly, not to get any colour in. Um, but if you want a little bit more colour, you can leave the grapes in the press for a bit or just leave the grapes and the juice sitting together for an hour, two, three hours, 
and that gives you just enough colour. Then when you press, you get very slightly pink tinged juice and then you ferment that as if it was a white wine. Um, so you, you, the difference between white and red wine is with white, you, you, you press the grapes and the juice and you effectively end up with dried grape skins that you throw away and then you get the juice and you ferment it and turn it into wine. With red wine, you press the grapes and the juice together, but then you leave the grapes in the juice and ferment the grapes with the, ju the juice with the grapes inside. And over that uh, one, two, three weeks of fermentation, the color starts to come out of the skins and to give you the tannin and the color from, from the red. So this rosé is made by a very light pressing, um, probably very little maceration at all. Um, and one thing, that, so Jean-Marc is an extremely good rosé maker and he's always careful to have a blend of different varieties and uh, picking dates so that he can have different colored tanks of rosé. And part of the art of rosé making is to make the blend uh, to be balanced on the palate, but also to have a color that is just right. And as far as rosé color is concerned, you probably noticed in the last 10 years, rosé has got a lot paler. And a lot of that is driven by fashion. Um, if you drank rosé 10, 15, 20 years ago, a lot more of it was sweet. And a lot of the very deep coloured rosés, particularly New World rosés, had a kind of big, booming, aggressive fruitiness and often a little bit of sweetness too. And I think the reason the rosé has taken off so much is people discovered Provence rosé. Provence rosé has always been dry. It's always been a sort of very pale colour, pinkish, but also even slightly orangey. The French will call it onion skin colour. Um, and that became the sign of sort of expensive, classy, dry rosé. So a lot of people who were looking to avoid the, the slightly sweet, sickly stuff moved to be, drink the paler stuff that was from France. And so Provence rosé has taken off as an absolutely phenomenal success. They, they're now turning a lot of the red grapes that they were making into red wine in Provence and making rosé out of it instead because the rosé boom has been enormous. And anyone heard of Whispering Angel? Yeah, yeah. A couple, a few nods, but a lot of blank looks. Whispering Angel was a brand created by this guy called um, Alexis Lachine, who realised that you can sell Provence rosé at 15 quid a bottle. You put it in a pretty bottle with a lovely label and call it a fancy name, you can happily sell lots of it for 15 pounds a bottle. And he's now selling three or four million bottles a year um, and sourcing it. He's having to buy wine from other people because he just doesn't have enough himself. So he's sourcing it from lots of different people. He's making really quite good money selling lots and lots of Whispering Angel. And people have realised you can sell rosé for, you know, people thought rosé was kind of a cheap, ordinary glugging wine, but now people realise that there are the market out there for selling really better, higher quality, dry rosé with lovely packaging. Um, and it's, you know, rosé has completely taken off in the last few years. So in France, they drink more rosé now than they do white wine. It's quite astonishing. Um, they're, you know, 25% of all the wine they drink in France is rosé, something like that. So anyway, I hope you like this one. Um, a little tip with your rosés, don't leave them in direct sunlight. Uh, clear glass bottles. Uh, if you buy a rosé from a shop shelf that's been sitting in the window, it's had the sun shining on it for any more than a few days, the light starts to just deteriorate the wine inside it. So if you've got rosé bottles, do be careful to keep them in the fridge, keep them in the box until you want to drink them. Don't leave them out on the side on a wine rack in the sunlight for a long time. Um, Marks and Spencer's a while ago had an odd experiment. They put all their rosé in green glass because of this exact reason, but then everyone stopped buying it. So they thought, well, that's a bad idea. It needs to be in clear glass, but uh, do look after it. Right, I think it's probably time to move on to the reds. This is the core of what we do. It's now uh, half past, so we're kind of good uh, halfway through, more than halfway through where we're going to be. So I'm going to suggest you now taste the domain of the bee um, rather than the genou. We'll do the genou last. Now, this is what we started making. And those three vineyard blocks I showed you earlier on um, are the, the source of domain of the bee. It's always been a blend of those three blocks. Um, and what it ends up being is roughly 50% the Grenache grape and 50% the Carignan grape. Um, excuse me, we have uh, three blocks. One of them is uh, pretty much pure Grenache. One of them is a real old mixture of different varieties in the same vineyard, but mostly Grenache. And then the last one is actually pure Carignan. The Carignan actually yields reasonable quantities of grapes. The Grenache can be totally disastrous. Some years you, you walk past 10 vines and barely pick a grape from them. Um, that's the vineyard I showed you at the beginning, the first one with, with the bit, the section that's really unproductive. Um, 
and it's very uneconomic. It can't, it, so we, let's give you a little example of what, what, what I mean by yield. A common um, metric is, you know, a bottle per vine. You can kind of picture that. Every vine has a bottle sitting next to it. Um, our, vine our vines grow about uh, 1.5 meters apart. So imagine a square with 12 vines in it. The worst vineyard gives you one bottle for 12 vines compared to other people's vineyards in you know, more fertile parts of the country that have got 12 bottles for 12 vines. So that's kind of expl explanation. We're having exactly the same cost to farm that vineyard. You've got to prune every vine, you've got to treat every vine, you've got to plow, you've got to spray, all those things you've got to do, um, but you're getting one twelfth of the wine. This is one reason why that vineyard is ter terribly unproductive, but it is the source of the Leisure Le 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 wine, which we'll try last. So, um, you know, we concluded a while back it was worth continuing with that vineyard in spite of the awful yields because the wine was so good. I've got to finish. Actually, I'm going to tip some of this away. No, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to finish a bit and tip the rest away because I can't drink it all. Right. Um, the main of the bee. I'm pouring my sample here. Um, what we've chosen for this tasting is the 2016 vintage. So. Those of you who've been following our emails will know that we had a bit of trouble in March. We had a, a bottling booked. Um, so we work in John Mark's winery. All of our, so the barrels behind me, you can see, are um, I'm not actually there. You probably gathered that. Um, this is a photograph, but it's a picture of our, of our barrels in John Mark's winery. We use 500 litre barrels and um, uh, you know, we have great space to store our wine there. And, but when it's ready for bottling, um, this year we actually called a mobile bottling truck to come to bottle our wine uh, for us and unfortunately they just rang us up and said sorry we're cancelling COVID-19 it's you know mid mid March France was locking down and they were told they couldn't get their workers to work and they didn't know what to do so they, they cancelled uh, 30 days of bottling and so we're, we're cancelling everything so we panicked at that point well, what, what on earth do we do we, we've got a load of customers expecting to buy our wine in a couple of months time and if they don't have any wine um, it's going to be a financial disaster we realized we had enough red in the country to fulfill the demand for the reds we wanted to sell, but we didn't have enough white and pink. So I work, one of the other jobs I do, so I'm, um, this is my, only my evening and weekends hobby. It's got a bit bigger than that, but um, my main job is as a wine consultant and I work with a bunch of different people. Um, and one of the guys I'm uh, actually part of the business now is a small project called the Bib Wine Company. Bib being B-I-B, which stands for bag in box. And the Bib Wine Company's mission in life is to take really good wine and put it into bag in box. Um, because there's absolutely no reason you can't put good wine in bag in box. We're just used to seeing cheap wine in bag in box. So people who look at the bag in box section on the supermarket. Um, oh, Amanda's joined us. Hello, I'm so sorry I'm late. Uh, we're just having a chat about how we got our wine out of France to get it bottled. Um, so we had, in the previous year or two, sold a little bit of our pink through the Bib Wine Company as the main uh, rosé wine of, of Bib Wine. And the way that they bring the wine from France is by uh, shipping it in a 1,000 litre bulk container. Amanda keeps disappearing. <laughs> this is, a, I don't know if Amanda really exists. <laughs> it's a ghost. She is a ghost. And She's... also, I'm just gonna apologize now. I've got the hiccups. I have not drunk a drop of wine all day. So forgive me if I hiccup it inadvertently. I'm gonna stop screen sharing so that Amanda appears real again okay. hello <laughs> um so yeah so uh, we had this problem in in uh, i forget exactly the date in march but the 12th of march something like that we were told the bottling was cancelled um and we thought what the hell do we do so because bib wine we're about to go and collect a thousand liters of the rosé in um something called an ibc which is essentially it's a pallet with plastic sides that open up to make a box and then there is a large um bag like a bag in box but a thousand liters of it that you, you plug the hose in at the winery and just fill it up and then you put the lid on and um, a lorry comes and you forklift onto the lorry and drive it to England. Um, and that's how we've been uh, shipping the, the, the bib wine wines and that enables them to buy from very small producers just a thousand litres at a time, not fill an entire tanker full of wine, which is how most wine gets to the UK. Um, and because we knew we were about to do this with the bib wine, we thought, well, why don't we just do that for our bottled wine and ship the bulk to the UK, ship the bottles, ship the corks, ship the capsules, all the stuff we'd ordered um, everything had arrived except for the boxes, which we bought in the UK this time. And we shipped them all over to the UK and uh, had them bottled by a very, very good English winery up in Gloucestershire. Um, and we were totally delighted that about three and a half weeks after being told the bottling was cancelled, we had the wine in the UK in our warehouse ready to sell, 
which is pretty fast acting. And we were, you know, lucky that we had we knew this technology existed and um, fast on our feet to make sure it happened. So luckily, you know, 2,400 bottles of rosé. If you don't have wine to sell in April, May, you don't get it here till July. It's you kind of miss the summer. Um, and we've already sold nearly three quarters of it in the month that we've been selling it. Um, so it was pretty vital that we did get the wine over here. But Amanda and I just went out to France last week um, because the, uh, the lockdown is easing in France and that's meant that the bottling company were able to reschedule the date. Um, and so we fixed the date and we decided to go out and supervise the, the bottling. So we, we've now bottled our 2018 wines. They're sitting at the winery and they're being collected on Monday and they'll arrive in the UK on Friday, Thursday and be in the warehouse you know, a few days later. So 2018s are on their way. But the wine we sold this year in our wine club uh, mixes was our 2016. Um, and that was because we just had enough of it, just enough to uh, furnish the needs of the wine club. And because it's tasting really, really good at the moment. And I thought it'd be a good wine to sort of show a wine in the kind of middle of its life. If you drink a wine just after it's bottled, it's a bit, you know, tight. It needs a little time to open out and a little time in the bottle to sort of meld together. Um, and we think our wines, I tend to say that after bottling, it's sort of two to eight years is probably the ideal window for our reds. This one's been in bottle for two and a half years now. So it's um, just beginning to really soften and open out. I think it's, uh, it's tasting lovely. Has everyone got wine? I think yeah. we managed successfully to get everyone a sufficient number of bottles of wine. So oh, um, it's not an enormous pour. I'm, I'm very <laughs> aware that, you know, four times 50 mils of wine isn't going to get anyone, you know, even over the limit, I suspect. So um, you may have to have another bottle on standby if you want to continue this evening uh, in a merrier fashion. But yeah, I hope you all have a glass of this. So this is 50-50 Grenache Carrier from the 2016 vintage. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna have my first taste. Oh, am I not allowed to read out private messages? Because there's quite a funny private message that's just appeared. And I won't tell you who it's from because I'm wondering why she did it privately. But it says, I'm ready to order a thousand litre bag in a box to a garage in Barnes. <laughs> I love it, that. It could be popular. I mean, actually, if you run a pub, there's no reason why you shouldn't just get a thousand litres and, and have a pump on the end and just pump it out. If you drink it in a, you know, five or six weeks, it should be fine. The last few drops might not be ideal, but um, yeah, you could definitely serve wine in that way. In fact, a few more people are starting to put wine into kegs now um, and you know, serve them in a, like in a, on a bar out of a keg. And you can get a good 50 litre keg with some really nice wine in it. Um, so I think... You know, people are realising that the glass bottle actually isn't the ideal packaging because it's breakable, it's heavy, uh, it's quite expensive. It co the environmental cost of melting glass, even recycled glass, is, is quite high. Um, the bib wine guys reckon I think it's six times less environmental impact for a bib wine glass of wine than, um, than a glass from a bottle. And that's quite considerable. So other people claim 10, but bib wine are only claiming six, but uh, they're being a bit conservative, I think. So there's lo lots of people are starting to say, why do we drink wine out of bottles? And I think for interesting, expensive wine that you want to keep, it's going to always stay in bottles. But everything under a tenner probably really doesn't need to be in a bottle. If, you, if you're drinking it, you know, in the course of a few months, happily buy it in a tetra pack or a, or a, a, a bag in box or um, a pouch. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background on these wines, uh, we pick our grapes by hand. It's kind of obligatory where we are. Um, there's no machine harvesters and the vines wouldn't cope with machine harvesting then. They're very old our vines. So our three plots are 65 years old, 85 years old and getting on for 100. We're not exactly sure how old it is but we think it's probably, we think it was 90 when we bought it and that was over 10 years ago. So we think it's 100. Um, so two of them were on full lockdown basically during the crisis. Two of the what? The vine, because they're so old. Oh, right. I'm not so old, because they hit that category. Yes. Sorry, so I'll, just, but, I'll just shut up. <laughs> the, the, well, sadly, I mean, the, the, luckily, the vines were... Was one of the things that was possible to do in France was actually get to work in the vineyard. So we have been able to have our vines kind of well looked after while we've not been able to get there. And apart from that, it's been pouring with rain. We've had the most amazing three months of sunny weather. Our spring was just, you know, here has been absolutely stunning. In France, it's been really the other way around. It's been raining a lot. It's been cold. Um, and you know heavy rain and then it's insistent, persistent rain so we'll be struggling a bit this year with mildew it may not be the easiest year we may end up ripening a good volume of really nice tasty grapes but there are likely to be a lot fewer grapes than they would have had if we hadn't had a mildew attack 
And it's possible, if mildew continues through the summer, that the quality of the wine will be affected as well. And we've been very lucky to have five years in a row, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, which are really good, really, really good vintages. If 20 turns out to be a really bad vintage, then you, know, you can say we've had a run of good ones to make up for it. 14 was a very difficult vintage for us. But this is 16, one of our, one of our best vintages, I think. And um, these old vines, they're hand harvested. We bring those grapes in little baskets, about 20, um, 10 to 12 kilos each, um, into the winery. And then we do one of two things. We either put them all through something called a distemmer. What that does, it knocks the grapes off and spits the stalks out of one end. So you've just got the grapes. The grapes then go through a crusher, which just pops them. Um, and actually, we started not crushing our grapes because we like to put the grapes into a barrel. We literally open, we, we take the end out of a barrel, we take the hoops off the barrel, we lift out the end, we put the hoops back on so it's sealed, but then you can put wine into it, put the grapes in the bottom, um, put them into a cold container for a, a week so that it's refrigerated and you've got this lovely grape soup macerating away in the cold, bringing colour out into the juice and, and beautiful fruit flavour. Every day I go and sort of plunge my hand around in them, fish out a bit of juice and taste it. And I, I used to start taking it back to my, um, to my house with uh, pouring it on my yogurt in the morning. It's like a coolie of intense <laughs> fruit. Um, and, and then we let the wine warm up and we start fermenting it. And it ferments in these big barrels. They're 500 litres, so they're kind of, you know, about this high on your chest. And you can lean over and push the grapes back down into the wine as they're fermenting. And very gently with your hand, you can kind of do this over two or three weeks until the wine's finished fermenting. Um, and then we press the wine and then we seal the barrels back up, and put the wine back into the barrels and keep the wine for uh, 14, 15 months in those barrels. And that's really it. That wine making is really very simple. So this wine has had all of those things done to it. Um, we choose which barrels to blend together. Um, in 2016, we made a separate Carignan blend. And then this is the best Carignan and the best Grenache in the Domain of the Bee blend. Have we got any other questions? What um, can you use to treat mildew? Yeah. Mm. And would we consider vineyards in the UK? All great questions. Um, uh, one of my friends in our region is called Katie, <coughs> Katie Jones. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, Katie lives out there with her French husband, uh, Jean-Marc, and she every morning is doing a walk around her vineyards uh, uh, live on Instagram. So you have to follow it, they have to have Instagram, but join Instagram live, look up Domain Jones, um, 7.30 in the morning in the UK, 8.30 in the morning in French time, she's standing on one of her vineyards and she'll do a 20 minute, 25 minute chat about what's going on. And it's, it's really lovely to wake up in the morning and just, just tune into, I've done it four or five times and actually her chat uh, two days ago was about mildew. Um, and the answer is you, you put a treatment on it called Bouis Bordelais, or Bordeaux mixture, which is a mixture of powdered copper sulfate and lime. And this was discovered 150 years ago by a guy in France who was sick of people driving past his vineyard and stopping and eating his grapes. He thought, I'm damn well going to stop those bastards eating my grapes. I'll spray them with something that looks horrible so they won't touch them. So he developed this bloom, I and mean, this is not a joke. Really? He, he thought, I'll just sacrifice the first row, no one cares. I'll just put this blue stuff on them, and people go, ugh, I'm not eating those. And that's why he, he did it. But he realised that those vines never got mildew. Oh. And so he thought, oh, hang on. They did some proper tests and worked out that that was a way of stopping mildew. Uh, so these are materials allowed by organic producers because they're naturally mined from the earth. They're still quite noxious chemicals. You know, lime and copper sulphate. Uh, it's, a, it's not a very nice thing to ingest. And you don't ingest it. You spray it on the vines and uh, it doesn't really reach the, the food chain. But um, that, that is how you control mildew and that's still the, an effective method there are some other methods uh, that are non-organic that uh, that you can also use um but in a year like this where it's so wet it's really hard to stop it and um yeah we've got a bit of mildew in our blocks and we don't know yet how it's going to progress can i just trust have you only done two bottles no we've done th uh, three and we're going to do the new in a little while i don't have it here I'm going to do it from memory. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, sadly, I can't open a bottle every time. I've, I've actually sent out all my bottles, and the last bottle of Chenu got sent out. Um, I forget who who was it. Um, it was, uh, it, yeah, there was a broken bottle that I had to send out the last bottle. Um, Mark, was it you? I think it was. Um, anyway, it's gone out, and um, 
uh, I don't have it here to taste, but I can remember what it tastes like. So uh, we're still on the domain of the bee, um, and I think we should probably move on to the new shortly. But um, yeah, this, the start of this one is, is, is big and chunky. It's close to 15% alcohol, very hard in our region to ripen Grenache grapes and have them taste really intense and get that to that point where you go, you go, yep, now's the time to pick them and not have them close to 15% alcohol. It's a, it's a grape that just likes, it ripens easily, it, grow, it adds sugar quickly. But if you taste them at 13 and a half and 14, they just don't taste quite right. And I like the big flavors and I like the rich uh, flavors you get with Grenache. And so our, you know, our Grenache tends to hit 15, 15 and a half and our Carignan 14, 14 and a half and they blend together and they're normally just under 15. Um, we're going to move on to the uh, Le Genoux shortly. Have you got any other questions? Here? Um, what's the sign of a great bottle versus a poor one? Uh, it's really gosh. hard. <laughs> um, it's really hard. It's about personal taste to a large extent. Um, there is a strange school of thought that says, you know that little dimple at the bottom of the bottle? If you shove your thumb up a long way, because the dimple's really big, the punt, that means it's a good bottle of wine. Uh, that is kind of nonsense, but it also is kind of true because it's about how much someone's spent on the bottle and it does correlate with quality. So it, if you judge in competitions and, and give the wine the medals and then measure the size of the punt, it correlates with the quality. Does it? It does, but it's mostly just because the more expensive wines get put in more expensive bottles. And so it's really a, it's going to correlate for price rather than for quality. Um, I, well, I, I would just, I don't think you can really tell anything other than your own taste. You have to taste a lot of wine. That's the, that's, the, that's the answer. And then someone else was asking whether we'd consider vineyards in the UK. Mm. Well, it's a very good and topical question. I was visiting two English vineyards earlier today. Um, we make um, an English sparkling wine, but we don't make it from our own vineyard. So if you think in France, we have three vineyards and no winery. In England, we've gone one step further. We have no vineyards and no winery. <laughs> Just bear with me. Um, we were able, we have a, a contact, so I know the Ridgeview guys very well. They're one of England's best wineries and I've worked with them a lot over many years through in many different employers. Um, and they're very good people and very good winemakers. Um, they put me in touch with one of their growers. He's actually in Herefordshire and he's a lovely chap. He grows, he's one of England's biggest asparagus growers and grows lots of soft brush and other things. Um, why not? And um, he and his dad planted a vineyard about 15 years ago. It's a sort of hobby. I mean, it's like two acres, so it's not enormous at all. Um, and the, they started producing seven or 8,000 bottles of wine uh, every year. And they started to realise that actually it's a little bit more than they could easily sell from the farm and to their mailing list. Um, so he started selling wine back to Ridgeview. And Ridgeview said, well, it's really good stuff, this. Um, I was looking for a partner to work with, not wanting to own a vineyard myself. So we've struck up a relationship with um, these guys from... Uh, Ross on Y, called the Chin family, um, and we produced our own label called Heart of Gold, based originally on their 2010 vintage. Um, we're just about to launch 2014, and we just changed the label. So those of you who know the Heart of Gold label, um, this is a, an updated version. This is the new look for Heart of Gold. Uh, it used to have a very gold label, but uh, a few people thought it was a little old-fashioned looking, and uh, yeah, I got, you know, I think some people really liked it, but I think this is going to be a bit sharper and a bit cleaner, and um, I literally picked it up today from Richie's. This is very hot off the press, almost entirely literally. Um, I haven't even opened the bottle yet. Uh, so you will be hearing, if you join our mailing list, about Heart of Gold next week. Because next week, or the end of next week, is the start of English Wine Week. So if you like English wine, it's definitely late June, I think 20th to the 28th or something, is English Wine Week. Fantastic. Karen, I can see your Heart of Gold right there. Oh, very good. That's the old label, and, uh, and this is the, the new one. Um, this one is 2014 Vintage. Uh, we decided to take the vintage off the labels because this is a, I'm going to get into some detail about oh, no, don't. the perils of small, time. oh we haven't got time, okay we won't get into details <laughs> about the labels, you can, we can, we'll do a Heart of Gold um, session sometime in the future and uh, we can chat about it then. Let's move on to Le Genoux because I think it's probably time to have a taste of that. Um, some of you probably have already because you've probably finished your, your domain of the bee. Mark's asked, oh, hello Mark and Mango, <laughs> uh, he's asked if I'll Corks are different for different wines. Um, good question. Um, so corks, I, I've been in the wine business for a long time. They, they grew to be a 
horrible problem with corks in the late 90s, early 2000s, and it just got worse and worse and worse. Essentially, cork is, an organ is a natural material from a, a tree bark. If you let chlorine anywhere near a cork, there's usually bugs that live in and around the, the um, cork forest that take chlorine and turn it into a mould. So when you open a, uh, if you ever opened a musty drawer of papers or something, it smells musty. That musty smell is using the chlorine in the paper and it's a mould that creates this odd musty smell. That's what makes wine corked. Now, the incidence of cork taint went from one in 200 bottles to about one in 20 bottles. So you'd open it, you know, we'd go to our wine tastings and open all the bottles of 100, 100 wines to show the journalists. Five or six or seven of them would be corked at the worst level of cork taint. Now, some of these were wines that you would probably drink and you wouldn't think were horrible, but you'd go, that wasn't the best bottle. I didn't really like it. Um, but if you were very sensitive to that nasty, musty smell, you'd go, ooh, I'm not drinking that. So people started to switch away from corks and plastic corks and screw caps really became popular. But a lot of people said they wanted to stick with corks. So someone has now worked out a way to grind up the cork particles, remove any possibility of there being this TCA uh, mouldy smell, and then glue them back together again. Um, there's a brand that we use, which lots of people use nowadays, called Diam, and we use that for all our wines. We just use a longer, higher spec, more expensive Diam for our wines that we age. Uh, it's called the Diam 10, and it's designed for wines that you lay aged more than 10 years. And then the uh, the white and the pink have a slightly shorter Diam, but it's still the same technology. And um, that's the answer to the question. So okay. let's move Genoux. on to Le Genoux. Le Genoux. So I showed you right at the beginning the uh, the vineyard block that had the individual vines that you could see. Um, that was the first block we bought, and that was the block with an incredibly low yield. And one year I just thought, why are we farming this Lincoln vineyard? We had 500 litres from 1.8 hectares, that's now four acres of land. We had 500 litres only. And I was just scratching my head thinking, this is no way, the farming cost is, is higher than we can sell the wine for. So we're losing money on this vineyard. Luckily, in some future years, we've had 1,000 or 1,200 litres, best ever, about 1,500 litres from that vineyard. Um, so the yield can be better. But I thought, if we can sell the wine for a higher price, if I make 1,000 bottles and I can sell them for £10 more, that's 10 grand. And that actually, that, that'll pay the farming costs. So, yeah, we should. Why don't we do that? So, um, in the very first year, we blended everything together. And the second year, we blended everything together. But the third year, the, the barrel from that vineyard was so delicious that we hand bottled it. We just, has anyone siphoned petrol out of a car? I don't believe you. I've, I, I've yeah. done many occasions. There's a few people who might have done. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah, picked up <laughs> I'm not talking about it, but yes, uh, um, I'm sure some of you nefarious people who've had a nefarious past have done that. Um, you push a hose into the, into the car and you suck and you try not to get petrol in your mouth and then you siphon it out into a can and fill up your car. Um, we were siphoning wine out of the barrel straight into the bottle and then banging the corks in. Amanda, Sam and I, and actually some friends who were with us that, that, that weekend. Um, and we banged the corks in, dipped them in beeswax and sold them as that single barrel, almost as a kind of family experiment rather than a proper wine. And it was really popular and everyone loved it. So the next year we did two barrels. And then every year after that, we had enough barrels that we think were good enough and we could spare the wine from the main wine. We bottled uh, what we call Le Genou. And Le Genou, um, is a kind of, it's a kind of little, not very amusing joke. Uh, anyone who speaks French well might realise that Le Genou means the knees. And then you think of the B and the knees, it's the bee's knees. So that was what we were trying to uh, subtly hint at. No French person has any idea why I've called my wine the knees. They look very blank. Go, why didn't you call it the knees? Don't understand. And a lot of English people don't know that Genou means knees and just think it's a, a name. But that's why it's called that. Um, and so it has everyone got their genou now in their glasses? Excellent. And it, it comes from this ancient vineyard, 100 year old. Um, when you walk past all the vines in the vineyard, every vine is different. Nowadays, if you plant a vineyard, you go to your nursery and you say, I want 5,000 Chardonnay vines or 5,000 Grenache vines. And they give you these identical vines. They're clones. Um, pretty much the whole nursery industry has worked towards cloning the best styles, the best varieties, and then selling you the best virus-free cl clone material you can buy. In these old, olden days, they used to take their best vines and take cuttings and the budwood, and then they'd grow little um, seeds, or shoots from the budwood, and they'd graft them to the rootstocks that they needed to plant a new vine, and individually plant their own vines from their own 
uh, selection. And often they would mix the vines in the vineyard because they wanted to have, if one year a particular grape didn't work too well, they had another grape to, to fall back on. So our vineyard is essentially about 70% Grenache, black Grenache, and then about 30% of other grapes. And they are white Grenache, pink Grenache, Carignan, white Carignan, I haven't seen any pink Carignan, mid of Macaba, occasional Muscat vine. So a real old mixture. And as you walk along, you know, there's three wines, three vines of one vine, another a different one, a pink one, two white ones, seven red ones. So that's what you've got in the vineyard. And um, it means the colour is a bit lighter. There's maybe 15% of the grapes are not red. And so they're fermenting with the other grapes, but they're, they present no colour at all. And they give a bit more complexity and a bit more delicacy. Actually, it often ends up a slightly lighter wine than the main wine. It's not so deep in colour. It's not so tannic. But it's got a length to it and a, and a sort of suave softness and a, and a perfume that I think is you know, really distinctive. And if you, in the world of wine nowadays, if you buy a wine that has a yield of less than 10 hectares a hectare from a 100 year old vineyard uh, on very special soil, in any other part of the world, you can spend, you know, one or two hundred pounds on a bottle that, that has those credentials. And, you know, we charge 10 or 12 pounds more than our regular wine for this. And I think it's cheap at the price. Knowing what goes into it, knowing how few bottles we make every year, and knowing the love and care that goes into it. Uh, when we show it at tastings, people divide into people who just definitely prefer the bigger, richer, darker, fuller flavoured wine domain of the bee, um, and find the other one a little bit light and they don't quite understand, you know, their palate just does, doesn't pick up those subtleties. But there's other people who just go, oh, I absolutely love that. It's so succulent and, and delicious and it's got a roundness and a softness. And so we have a handful of people who are, who are totally nuts about Le Genou. And it started selling really, really well. So we actually run out almost completely of all our Le Genou. We've just about shipped the 2018. There are 15 bottles left of the 17 and, 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 uh, and, and 15, the two vintage before that. I've got a handful more in the cellar that we're keeping for dinners. But no, that's basically it now. So you're tasting, you know, one of the last bottles of the 15 unless you happen to have someone at home, some wine at home. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm really proud of it. And I think it's one of the wines that people, you know, when they talk about what we do, people do start to talk about now Le Genou as being a, a, a really special wine, and a wine to really look out for. Um, we can't make a lot more of it because we have this vineyard. We could make three barrels a year at the most if we took all of it out of the regular wine. But I, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, Probably it's a good time now just to open it up to questions. We actually have past eight o'clock, so uh, forgive us for overrunning, but um, I don't want to kind of curtail the point uh, where you can actually just chip in and ask some questions. So if you've got them, unmute and, and chat, or otherwise, uh, if there's no questions, then we can draw it to a hold. <laughs> what, what do you most enjoy about your job? <laughs> mm. Spreadsheets, I think Amanda would say. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, my job is... Uh, multifarious. I do lots of different things, and I do a lot of uh, um, a lot of consulting to other people. So you know, I've, theoretically, three or four days a week, I should be doing consulting work for other people. This last few months, I've had a, uh, no travel at all, no wine judging, no work, very little work. I mean, a little bit of work, uh, online work, but it's it's very difficult to do what I do online. So I've had a lot more time to devote to Domain of the Bee. Um, the thing I most like about making wine is plunging my hand into a barrel of fermenting wine it's fantastic it's it's a sensory experience and you you can smell and and taste and touch and you can feel the temperature gradient and it's you know we last year last autumn we brought out uh, 16 people came out for the weekend our wine club members came out and all got involved they all picked um a little block of our one of our vineyards we had just enough grapes to make one barrel uh, we tipped the grapes straight into the barrel and trod them by foot. Uh, so it's had 16 people's, 16 pairs of feet have trod uh, this particular barrel, but they're all promising to buy it and drink it themselves. Uh, so it may never hit the, the, the market. We may, we may bottle it as a single barrel, um, but they really, really, really enjoyed the chance to spend two or three hours picking, have a vineyard lunch, bring the grapes to the winery, and then just see what happens at the winery. There was other grapes being brought in by Jean-Marc so they could see all the crusher working, but just doing this in a very hand uh, or foot artisanal way. And then I sent them over the next few weeks, sent them sort of weekly reports on how the, how the barrel was doing, what was happening to it. And um, it's keenly awaited, this, the news of this barrel. Uh, if we make it into a single wine, it'll be next year. 
and it'll be the members barrel and we may do it in future years so it's definitely something that we're planning this year if i'm not too sure whether to make a big thing of it and invite a load of people and find we can't do it but if it's allowed we'd definitely love to have a bunch of people come out for a weekend in early october and come and try and do the same thing i can't guarantee we can pick a vineyard block at the time um sometimes it just you just have to pick it earlier because the, the weather tells you nickel the feet <laughs> could nickel the feet yeah we, it's a good question. we have the knees we're, we're going down <laughs> can, I, can i ask you about the uh, the white wines or the white yes. and the pink of course uh, the, uh, they're, they're um last year's vintage aren't they 2019 yes exactly uh, do they get better or worse through keeping well good, very, really good question um i think most pink wine uh that is made for summer drinking is absolutely perfect in the summer after it's made and fine through christmas but okay. if you if you open a bottle of last year's pink alongside this year's pink i think you'd really prefer this year's pink it's fresher it's got more bright fruit um okay. so with the pink wine that we make um i would definitely advise we try and make enough to sell out in the early autumn so anyone who's still got wine and drinking it at Christmas is, is totally fine. And I had a bottle the other day, I mean, like a month ago, and it was, it was nice wine, good wine. But it's definitely, you, you taste the fresh young one and it's just got bright, brighter and fresher flavours. The white, I think, um, has probably got two or three years of life in it. I know someone who likes it three or four years old, so he'll buy it and keep it because he prefers it when he's older. Um, I think it probably needs, it's, it's probably almost at its best, maybe a year later than the... Um, than the pink it has all the virtues of the freshness and zing of a young wine in the first summer but in the by the second summer it's built a bit more peachy richness and a bit more complexity so i think it's a little bit about your own taste but um you know, it's a wine for one to three years rather than to drink it in the summer oh thank but you given, thank given you. the difference between the two is just a little bit of grape skin why should that be the case um part of it is the um, style of the wine, the age of the vineyards. So I said that the white has got some really old grapes with very low yields. Um, and when you've got really concentrated, rich, full flavoured grapes, you get a longer lasting wine than you. And, and so also so a little bit of the wine making has been geared towards making wine with a bit more structure um, and a, a little bit more capacity to age, a little bit of oak aging as well. So you're, you're right, you could absolutely make, and, and John Mark does make, a sort of joyously fruity young whites that are really intended to be drunk in the first summer like the rosés. But this particular white is made for a bit more uh, of, of long aging because it contains some of these wonderful 100 year old vines. That's probably the best answer I can give you. And some other whites are made really for aging uh, for, for longer, longer periods. You can make white, whites that barrel aged and designed to be kept for five or 10 years. And, um, you know, yeah, we, we, we haven't yet. It says on the back label of our white, if you, if you buy a bottle, that uh, we want to buy our own white wine vineyard. And we have been looking, but it's a big financial commitment. And we also have to work out how to get the wine made. And one day we will make our own white, in a, probably in our own barrels. We'll actually make a barrel fermented white, but it'll be a slightly more complex, more expensive, um, more long lasting wine that's designed to be aged uh, as and when we do. That was what I was looking for. Oh, yes, that's the picture of me plunging my hand into a barrel. Can you see it's, that? It's a bit, uh, it looks like a red thing and make a mulling some black things. But, that's, um, what, that's what Justin's arm looks like when it goes into a barrel of grapes. It's really quite scary. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's a lovely thing to do. And so I'm, I'm a, fan, a definite fan of uh, coming out and plunging your hand into it. I think once you've done that, you know, you've made contact with the wine and then you're, you're, you know, you're hooked for life. Never done that, you start the foot in. Oh, sorry. Gosh, I'm guessing a message from Andy Roberts, long time no see. Hello, Andy. <laughs> Where are you, Andy? I don't know if I've got you on the screen. Wave. There. Ah, hello, <laughs> how are you? Good to see you. There's a lot of people here I know, and actually a lot of I haven't met yet, but I hope those of you we haven't met yet, please, you know, if you want to join our mailing list, we will send you semi-amusing emails. They're quite amusing. Uh, we, try and, um, we try and make them amusing. Um, and we will invite you regularly to come and taste wine in our house. I'm sorry if you don't live anywhere in L near London, we can't do much about that, but we can send you wine and do it that way. But um, you know, we, when we're allowed to, we have regular sort of summer tastings and um, winter wine tastings, which the last few years have, unfortunately, we, we had one year where we, we had more empty bottles 
at the end of the tasting, Annie's smiling at this point because I can see she might have been responsible for emptying some more empty bottles than we had sold <laughs> bottles that day. It wasn't the most successful commercial venture. But they're great fun. They're quite good fun. Um, and a lot of the people who bought the wine had already bought a load from us and came along just to have a taste and a, a, and party. a, and a party. So that was totally fine. And actually our house is normally tidier than Justin's office, which is why he put the background up, first of all. Yes, I want to stress that that bed there is, is you know, I'm not living in a bed sit. <laughs> uh, it's just a spare bed in the office. So I don't want to keep any of you beyond, you know, you might be thinking, I haven't had supper yet. I need to go away and cook. Um, so please, at this point, feel free to drift away. Um, if anyone's got any more questions, do do pitch them in. Uh, otherwise, we'll kind of call, call it to halt in t five minutes. There was so. one question we didn't pick up, which was about the recyclable nature between the difference between bib wine and glass bottles. Yeah, no, good question. So uh, glass obviously can be recycled. The problem with recycling glass is actually most of it goes into landfill or, or for making motorways because the co so first of all we don't produce very much in England that uses green glass if you think about all the things we make here beer tends to be in brown bottles lots of jars of clear glass we don't make a lot of wine that needs green glass so the green glass here doesn't have much of a use it does get made into secondary things but a lot of it goes into landfill so it's although it's recyclable it's not that helpful when you do recycle glass you have to heat it to an incredible temperature and it's that heating that takes all the energy. So most of the cost of a glass, I mean, a, a recycled glass bottle has probably got 80% of the energy cost of a, of a brand new glass bottle. 80% um, of the CO2 uh, effect. Um, with bag in box, you have a much bigger volume in a much smaller amount of packaging. So if you strip down three or four bottles and put them there with their corks and their capsules and the glass and the labels and the cardboard, it's quite a lot of stuff. If you pack down a bag in box, you've got one small cardboard outer and then a plastic bag and a tab. Now the plastic bag itself is plastic, so you can't avoid that. Um, it's in many places nowadays is recyclable, but the problem with that is it's like you have to look at the bottom of your plastic trays and see what type of plastic it is. It does depend which uh, local authority it is as to how they realistically actually recycle it. Um, we're working with Bibwine on a plan to, like Nespresso, to have an envelope in which you pack your empty um, uh, bags and send them back and get them properly recycled centrally. So that is intended to be a solution in the future. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of the, you know, the, the downsides of, you've got the incredible upside of much lower carbon footprint, but you do have the downside of a little bit of plastic. Um, audio always, can you recommend a good everyday wine glass manufacturer? Oh, yeah, I struggle with, because I mean, expensive glasses are great, lovely to drink wine from, but really expensive. Um, I have a handful of, of uh, one or two Riedels and the odd Zalto, but I don't use them very much. That's because not every day. They don't go in the, no, 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 they don't go in the dishwasher. I'm sort of leading up to the fact that, frankly, you know, we bought these for three or four pounds a glass, I think. Uh, I can't remember who from, so sorry, but uh, John Lewis have got a reasonable range of quite cheap glasses. If you get a cheap glass, it's heavy <laughs> and doesn't have the delicacy and fineness. I, w I want to know why Audio Always are cheering. Have they had a... so, my sister, whose boyfriend asked the question, actually works for John Lewis. So she's just massively excited. <laughs> Any mention of John Lewis, yes. Well, I used to work for Waitrose, so we're obviously loyal fans of John Lewis. Um, they're pretty good. But, you know, I think Tesco have got some quite good glasses, sorry to say. Um, um, Not good that well. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I, essentially, for my money, the shape is the most important thing. You want a glass that's narrow at the top than it is at the bottom and it's got a decent capacity. So when you fill it to about a quarter or a third of the volume, you've got a decent glass of wine and you can swirl it and smell it and you get you know, what you need from it. If the glass is a bit thick and it's a bit clunky because you only put two quid on it, so be it. It goes in the dishwasher. You don't have to worry about it if you break it. If you spent 15 quid on a whatever or 45 quid on a Riedel and then you break it you, you you get really upset so I don't ever use my Riedels except for very special occasions and I tend to use these and they go in the dishwasher right I think probably that is enough uh it's I need a drink I've, I've had a couple but I think I need some more so I'm going to leave you all I really appreciate your company and also thank you so much to Karen and Jeff and everybody who invited their friends so really lovely to meet you new people do please if you join our mailing list, you, you know, we won't spam you. 
we send you amusing stuff and we invite you, we get you to tell you what we're doing and invite you to tasting. So we'd love to hear more from you if you wanted to. You can unsubscribe really easily if, if you decide it's a bit much. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed it. And if we get the chance to meet in person or meet in France, uh, I'd love to. And also hello to everyone who I know really well, who I'd love to chat to. My friend Jeff from Cambridge, he was the stroke. I was number seven in our <laughs> first date. Uh, I haven't seen really enough of Jeff and lots of you I'd like to spend more time chatting to, but I can't indulge the rest of you while I do that. So <laughs> thank you for joining us and let's say good night. And if you want, some of you, many of you are actually joining future tasting. So we'll see you there. Thank Thanks you. Bye. 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 Bye.